Hi everyone, my name is Monique, and today I'm going to be showing you how to play a game that is coming soon called Evil Corp. Evil Corp is a company that takes pride in knowing that they are the best at frightening human villages. Each year, they hold a competition to see which of their managers is the best at scaring humans. And so in this game, two to four players play as one of these managers who are trying to win the competition by recruiting the best team and being the first to frighten two human villages. This game is designed by Jeremy Ducret and published by Le Botteju, who are helping sponsor this video. And so this game is a mix of mechanics. You have bag building, you have tile activation, as well as a bit of area majority. And it also plays a bit differently depending on the player count. And so today I'm going to be showing you how to play the two player game. And I'll also discuss the three and four player game towards the end of the video. And for anyone attending Essence Spiel, this game will be available in limited quantities at the Le Bote de Joux booth. So for more information, we've included a link to their website as well as their booth number in the description below. Last but not least, if you enjoy content like this and would like to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. And with that, let's get started. So if you'd please direct your attention to the center of the table, we're all set up here for a two-player game of Evil Corp. Welcome to the two quite unfortunate villages. They look pretty peaceful now, but not for long, because in this game, our only goal is to scare these villages as much as we can. And so just to kind of give you the lay of the land, in a two-player game, players are going to be sitting opposite each other, and each player has their own player screen. And this is important because over the course of the game, both players will have access to both villages, but you'll only be playing your pieces to your side of the village. Now thematically, we are both managers at this company, and so we each start the game with a team of eight basic monsters. And at the start of the game, our teams are both identical. Now over the course of the game, we will have the opportunity to recruit more monsters and place them into our bag, because this is a bag builder of sorts. If you've ever played a bag building or a deck building game before, you'll know that one of your goals is to try to acquire stronger and stronger items to go in your bag. It's a very similar concept here, except we are going to be recruiting monsters to place into our bags in order to place them out and activate their abilities and try to scare these villages. And so the game is played over the course of several rounds, and each round is divided into two phases. You have the day phase, where players will be taking all of our actions, and then you have the night phase, where we'll be checking for victory conditions and cleaning up for the next round. During the day phase, players will be taking turns, taking one action each until both players have passed. And so the first type of action that you can take is deploying a monster to one of the two eligible villages. And so even though players start the game with the same eight basic monster tiles in their bag, we actually start the round by drawing five of them and placing them behind our player screens. So when taking this action, you have to choose one of the monster tiles from behind your player screen, not from your bag. And then you have to choose which village to deploy them to. And so the features on both of these villages are the same. So let's just go ahead and take a look at this village as an example. When deploying a monster, you can choose to deploy your tile to one of the four areas of the village board. And one of the main areas that you'll be focusing on are these three battlefield spaces, and they are indicated by the double sword symbol. Monster tiles come in three different colors. We have red, blue, and yellow. And the number at the top left-hand corner is their terror value. When deploying a monster tile to one of the three battlefield spaces, you're going to move the terror pawn a number of spaces equal to its terror value. And when doing so, you always move the pawn towards your opponent's side. This is basically keeping track of who is currently frightening this village the most. During the night phase, players will be awarded benefits depending on where the terror pawn is at the end of the round. If you're able to move the pawn all the way up to the last threshold, then you'll score an immediate victory for this village at the end of the round. Otherwise, just getting the terror pawn to this very first threshold over here will allow you to advance your conquest pawn at the end of the round. And the first player to get their conquest pawn to the very middle wins a victory for that village. And the player who wins two victories first is going to be the winner. Now when deploying monster tiles, some tiles also have a deployment power that is resolved immediately after deploying it. And so if I were to deploy this tile, I would also get a gold coin from the supply. Gold coins in this game are used to recruit more monsters, as you'll see later. But just as a note, gold is actually public knowledge, and so you never place these behind your screen. Now when deploying a tile to a battlefield space, if you were the first player to deploy a red tile, you loot the village's treasure. And so you actually get to claim this token, gaining you gold from the supply equal to your terror value. And this is for each village, each round. And so if I were to claim the loot token for this village, then somebody else can claim it for this one. Now you probably noticed that there's also a blue power stone. And so the first player in each village to deploy a blue monster tile to a battlefield space 
gets to claim the Power Stone, and this will essentially allow you to break ties at the end of the round. Now I mentioned this earlier, but it's very important that you maintain the terror gauge throughout the game. Which means if ever a tile is removed from a village board, you should also move the terror pawn to reflect that. The terror gauge should always be an accurate reflection of the power balance that exists in both villages. Now in addition to the three battlefield spaces, we also have one fortification space that actually functions pretty similarly. The difference is that when deploying a tile to the fortification space, you of course still adjust the terror gauge as normal, but any tiles deployed to your fortification are not eligible for either the loot token as well as the power stone. Only those deployed to the battlefield spaces can take these. But at the end of the round, you'll have the option to pay gold coins in order to keep your monster tile there, giving you a little bit more power for the next round. Next, we have the two port spaces, which don't allow you to go to battle, but can potentially earn you some gold coins. When deploying a monster to a port space, you don't adjust the terror gauge according to the terror value. Because they're not as frightening, probably, <laughs> from the water. Instead, if it's still available, you can gain the gold coins that are on one of the two cargo spots on the board, depending on the color of the monster tile that you placed out. So since I placed out a yellow monster tile, I can claim these two gold coins because they're still here. And that's in addition to the gold coin that I get from my deployment power. And if I had deployed either a red or a blue tile, then I can claim the cargo that's on that space. And cargo spaces refill at the end of the round, so you'll have an opportunity to claim them again next round. And finally, we have the last space, which is called the Demonic Portal. Only blue monster tiles can be placed on the Demonic Portal. And just like the ports, when placing a tile there, you do not adjust the terror gauge because you can't go to battle via that space. Instead, the monster tile that you place there will allow you to activate one of the available demon tiles that are on the office board. This is where the game becomes tactical, because these demon abilities are going to allow you to do things like discard one of the tiles that your opponents deployed, or permanently remove one of your own monster tiles from the game, and the third demon ability allows you to draw a certain number of tiles from your bag and then discard that number, so that maybe you could try to find the one that you need. These demons, by the way, are not going to change. These are the three that you'll play with every game. And in order to activate a demon tile, you must first calculate the summoning value of the monster tile that you place on the demonic portal. And so the summoning value is going to be the terror value plus any bonuses. So for my tile, my summoning value would be two because I have a little plus one underneath my terror value. And the summoning value actually determines the strength of the action. So if I wanted to activate this demon, with a summoning value of two, I would be able to discard a monster tile with a terror value of one from one of the two boards on my opponent's side. If I had a summoning value of three, I could discard one with a terror value of two. And if my summoning value was only a one, I would have to pay two coins <laughs> to do this. So as you can see, the higher your summoning value, the better the effects are. And when using a demon tile, you flip it over because it becomes inactive for the rest of the round. And those are all of the four different areas that you're gonna be deploying tiles to. Now, in addition to deployment bonuses, some monster tiles also have an activatable power, which in this example, this monster tile actually has both. It has a deployment power that I can gain immediately after deploying it, and it also has an ability that I can activate once it's been deployed. And this is actually the next type of action, which allows you to activate the ability of a monster you've already deployed. Activating monster abilities in this game is the other large strategic layer in addition to these demon tiles. And this is due to the fact that monster tiles come with a wide range of abilities. You'll see tiles that allow you to draw additional tiles from your bag to place behind your player screen. Of course, you'll see tiles that force your opponent to discard their monster tiles. Some tiles, such as this one, allow you to force an opponent to flip over one of their monster tiles. And any monster tiles flipped to their inactive side cannot be activated in terms of using their abilities. There are also abilities that allow you to permanently remove monster tiles from the game, and there are also powers that allow you to flip over a demon tile, either reactivating it or placing it to its inactive side. And so when taking this action, once you finish resolving the ability, the monster tile gets flipped to its inactive side to show that you cannot reactivate its ability. Now some tiles, such as this one, have a passive power as long as it stays on its active side. And so this tile actually gives you plus one to the terror value of any yellow tiles that are deployed to any battlefield spaces. And so if ever an opponent forces you to flip over this tile, you would lose out on that quite strong passive ability. This also means that when activating an ability, even though you don't lose out on the terror value, you will lose out on any passive powers that they may have. 
And similar to the activatable powers, there's also a wide range of passive powers that you'll be seeing on the various monster tiles. There's actually an appendix at the very back of the rulebook if you'd like to see what all of the different powers are in the game. And finally, we have the last type of action that simply allows you to recruit a new monster from the office board. When recruiting a new monster tile, you have to pay gold equal to whatever the gold value is on the right hand side of the tile. If you choose one of the two tiles that are at the very back of the queue, then you have to pay an additional one or two gold. And any monsters recruited get placed directly into your bag, not behind your screen. And as you can see, recruiting monsters will give you access to much stronger monster tiles that you don't have access to at the start of the game. And that's essentially it. Those are the three different types of actions that you can take on your turn. Now, over the course of the day phase, you are allowed to ask opponents how many tiles they have behind their player screen, and they are obligated to tell you the truth. Because these tiles essentially serve as a timer for the day phase. And on your turn, if you can't, or you decide that you don't want to take an action, then you must pass. And as soon as everybody passes, then the night phase begins. The first thing that happens during the night phase is you resolve each village one by one by determining the effects of their terror gauge. And players gain the cumulative awards depending on where the terror marker is. So in this example, because I was able to push up the terror marker into my opponent's side, this symbol means I get to move my conquest pawn forward one space. Now if at the end of a round I'm able to get my conquest marker to the central space, then I win the victory over this village. Anytime you win a victory, the village gets reset. So at the start of the game, we're playing on the A sides of both of these villages. And as soon as the player wins victory over either of these villages, then you flip it over to its B side, which is a bit different, and you set it up accordingly. And in the case of a tie, if the terror marker were ever in the very center of the village board, then the player who has the power stone gets to progress their conquest marker up one space. This village, on the other hand, is a bit of a different story. So here, my opponent was able to push the tear pawn all the way up to this space. And the rewards, again, are cumulative. So not only do they get to advance their conquest marker one space, but they also get two magic gold coins. And so the difference between the magic coins and the regular ones are that these you don't have to discard at the end of the round. Now, once you've resolved all villages, then you do a bit of cleanup. Then all monster tiles get discarded. That includes tiles that are on all of the villages, as well as any that might still be behind your player screen, although that is not likely. And discarded monster tiles go into your own personal player discard pile. At this point, if you have any monster tiles on fortifications, you can pay gold to keep them there for the next round. And any monster tiles kept this way are flipped over to their inactive side. And so if my opponent chose to pay to keep their Terra level 1 yellow tile on their fortress, then I would start the next round with the Terra marker up one space since mine has a value of 2 and theirs has a value of 1. Then each player with any gold coins remaining in front of them must discard them all, except for the magic gold. You would then update the recruitment queue by discarding the monster tile from the will be in touch space. <laughs> it has a name. The rest of the tiles would slide down and you would fill in a new monster tile at the very back of the queue from the monster bag. You reactivate any of the inactive demons. Then you end the night phase by drawing a new set of five monster tiles from your bag and placing them behind your player screen. And then you pass the first player token to the next player. And you start again with the next day phase. And as soon as a player is able to win two victory tokens, then they win the game, and they prove that they are the best human-scaring manager who works at Evil Corp. And that is essentially how you play Evil Corp at two players. Now when playing with three players, three village boards are set out in between each player and only the boards to your left and right are considered eligible, meaning those are the only two village boards that you can affect. Other than that, gameplay remains the same, but during the day phase, each player takes one action each going clockwise. A four player game also uses three village boards, but the difference is you play in teams of two. And similar to the three player game, each player only has access to the village boards to their left and right, which means this central village board can be accessed by all four players. And during the day phase, teams alternate taking both of their actions before moving on to the next team. And there you have it, that is how you play Evil Corp, which is a game that is going to be releasing in retail soon. And again, for those of you attending Essence Spiel, this game will be available in limited quantities at the Le Bote de Jus booth. So for more information, we've included a link to their website as well as their booth number in the description below. Otherwise, thank you all so much for watching the video. I really hope it was helpful. If you have any questions about anything that you saw here today, please feel free to leave me a comment down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Lastly, if you enjoy content like this and would like to see more in the future, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Bye.